Good morning. Welcome to the Foundation Church this morning. To those in the sanctuary, we greet you with a happy Mother's Day. And for those online as well, we hope and pray that you have a beautiful Mother's Day today. I greet you with these words from God, from Colossians. It says, be wise in the way you act toward others. Make the most of every opportunity that your conversations be always full of grace. Stand with us to sing this morning our opening song, Glorious Day. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. Was my tomb till I met you. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. Your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. He did rescue, my sin was heavy A chain break at the weight of your glory I need a shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I breathe I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into the glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day And I want to wish uh, all the mothers here a happy Mother's Day. I hope it will be a beautiful day for all you mothers. And special greetings for mothers here in the sanctuary and online watching us. I hope you and your family took advantage of the breakfast this morning. And I can't wait until we can live stream. Uh, oh, crap. Blew it. I can't wait until we can live stream muffins. 
Man, sorry, Randy. That was a great joke, and I blew it. Yeah, you did a great job. Thank you to Holly and Todd Prince for setting it up. They were here for a few hours yesterday. Also yesterday, we had a car wash. So thank you for everybody that came. We raised $540 yesterday. Uh, today's message by Pastor Dave has a special message about Mother's Faithfulness titled Abigail and Be Faithful. Two fun activities coming this week, markmanship and a flexercise. The flexercise is a gentle stretching and exercise group for women that my wife is leading. And Ernie is here to tell us about the other group. Okay, I'm Ernie, and I lead the marksmanship group. Um, it, we're meeting on Wednesday evening. We go out and shoot targets and clays and just have fun and blow off some uh, ammunition. <laughs> so if anybody's interested, there's some information on the back table with my contact and so on. And we'll go from there. Thanks. Awesome. I believe that's 5.30, Ernie, on Wednesday night here at church? Correct. Okay, 5.30. Men and women are both invited. So if you have that urge to learn about guns, that's a good chance to do it safely, we hope. Right. <laughs> um, and there's more information on our men's Bible study group that is meeting every other week. We met for the first time last Wednesday, and we had 20 guys show up. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, more exciting news coming up next Sunday, May 23rd. The Teen Challenge will be with us in the morning service, and at 5 o'clock, Lori Comrade will speak about her experience with working with human trafficking in Michigan. Please plan to attend. Also, there's a Connect card here. If you could fill that out, and if you're watching online, if you could click the link. Thank you. Thank you. Join us in singing our songs this morning. Living hope. I'll break the chasm that lay between us. I'll hide the mountain I could not climb in desperation. I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. No Finished. The end is written. Jesus Christ, my living home. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could? Such boundless grace, the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the Death has lost its grip on me. 
Good morning, everyone. Just wondering how much money I could make starting a online dieting, virtual muffin eating experience. I'm glad that we're not trying to do uh, target practicing virtually either. And um, what a fun place to belong to. Uh, we're very thankful for each and every one of you mothers here today. Happy Mother's Day to you, and, and a, a blessed time this morning as I see many uh, children who have come to sit with their mothers as well, and, and um, it's going to be a beautiful day uh, together. I'm sure it already has been. Um, one person that um, reached out to Kurt and said he was kind of be on the download today, but he didn't reach out to me as Rod Gensick. It's his birthday today, so thanks be to God for Rod's uh, birthday. So, yeah. oh. Rod's uh, hiding somewhere. Uh, we're going to uh, promote already something to put on your calendar as well. So make sure on uh, June 30 that you block out your calendar for the evening period of time. Uh, we're going to have a church picnic that's also a community picnic. And so come on uh, June 30, we would like 100% uh, congregation um, involvement, and then also invite a friend. 
a neighbor, a relative, a, a co-worker, a friend. Make sure that uh, all of you come on June 30 because we're going to have a time where it's going to be a really, really good picnic. It's not going to uh, be... Um, Something that's mundane, it's going to have great food, it's going to have door prizes, it's going to have uh, great games, and we're going to really enjoy time together. Might even get wet, some of us, if we want, I don't know. Um, I don't want to throw any um, information out that um, I'm not 100% sure, but there's going to be 100% participation from this church, and there's going to be 100% participation from our community, and we're going to have a great night here on June 30. So make sure you block that out in your calendar, and... Um, as we do that, I'd like you to uh, turn your Bibles this morning to 1 Samuel 25. Now, if you don't have your Bibles with you today, that's fine. Um, the Scripture will be up on the screen. And uh, we're going to just kind of go through the Scripture uh, piece by piece and part by part today as we study a woman who, um, in all reality, was an incredible wife. And she was an incredible mother. And we're going to see today how she was faithful in Scripture. But before we go into Scripture, I'd like to ask that the Spirit enlighten us, that the Spirit open our eyes to Scripture as we read it today, but also a, a special prayer uh, this morning for those of you mothers who might be here today that are very, very happy, but there might be some here today that aren't so happy as well. And so I'd like to acknowledge that in, in the prayer, and we're going to go to the Lord in uh, prayer right now. Father, uh, today, Mother's Day can be very, very thankful and proud, but Lord, some are also hurtful today. And um, we believe that we honor mothers without alienating others here at this church. Because involved here today are those who have had miscarriages, those who have had divorce, those who had love to be married, those who are beyond childbearing years, those who are struggling with infertility. There are empty nesters. There are losses of children represented uh, in this room today. Those in this room also have children who they are struggling maybe with incarceration, maybe, Lord, with um, uh, children who yet are alive and in the world, but aren't uh, spending much time or giving much honor to their mothers. And Lord, so we want to ask that your spirit uh, be with the mothers who are here today, for the, with the women who are, have come today, and also the men who live in these families, as well as the children. And those uh, involved here today might have spiritually lost children as well. They might have lost their mothers to death. They might have experienced abuse at the hands of their mothers. And some may have watched their mothers be abused at the hands of a father. So today, Father, represented in this group and represented online are those who are women who have gone through a variety of experiences. We want to acknowledge that because Hallmark holidays are tricky. So we pray, Father, that in the spirit of unity this morning we come and we want all women and men to feel welcome today. Many people today find their value in being a mom and dad, and I pray today that our value is mostly found in being in Jesus Christ, as well as being in this friendship community of Jesus Christ. And Father, to those who gave birth to a child this year, we celebrate with them. To those who lost a child, we mourn with them. To those who experienced loss this year through miscarriage or failed adoptions or running away, we mourn as a community of Christ with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, who have been poked and prodded in doctor's offices only to have tears and disappointments, we walk with you, we pray with you as a Christian community and forgive us when we say foolish and unthoughtful things. We, we don't mean to make this harder than it is. And to those who are foster moms, mentor moms, adoptive moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointments and heartaches and distances from your children, we sit with you and we love you as a Christian community. And to those who have lost their mothers to death, we grieve with you. To those who have acknowledged abuse at the hands 
through the mouth of your own mother. We acknowledge your experience and, and, and validate that happened to you, and we hurt with you. And for those of you who have survived the overall testing of motherhood in your lives, we are far better having you in the midst of the Christian community today. For those of you who are empty nesters and whose nests will become empty in this upcoming year, we grieve with you and we rejoice with you as well. And whatever this case may be, in this hallmark, beautiful holiday called Mother's Day, we walk with you. And mothering or being a wife or being a woman in today's world is not for the faint of heart. And we have real warriors and heroines in our midst. We're going to find that from Scripture today. So Lord, open our eyes today as we open up 1 Samuel 25 and we look at a woman whose name is Abigail. Lord, bless us as we study you and as we study what it means to live in a life that you have given us. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. So there's people here in our lives that um, have saved our neck. We have, we have maybe been part of a family that we have had our neck saved. And um, today we're going to see such a person in Scripture who has saved somebody's necks. And um, we're going to look at a godly wife. We're going to look at a godly mother who lays it all out for her family, just like I know that you do. So resonate with the person in Scripture today. Take what this person in Scripture has to teach us and what God has to teach us through this wonderful character called Abigail who explains and shows such faithfulness and obedience to God in all her ways. This is a woman who saved her family's neck. And if the families in this congregation were to be honest, and those watching online today were to be honest, we could all admit to a mother showing some of Abigail uh, from time to time, can't we? And we've got to be thankful for that. This story, although in the ancient East, is of a, it, it reminds me of a Western. I love to watch Westerns, you know, the, uh, the dust rising up from getting on a horse and trying to stay on it while you're riding breakneck speed. And, and um, there's this wide open country with gritty heroes that are on horses. I love those. There's a tough and a beautiful heroine in Scripture today. And there's a tough and crusty and hard-hearted villain who complicates life for everybody in our story today. This story is not fiction. This story is very complex. This story is conflicted characters. This story is a, is a bunch of people who wind up on a collision course together out in the desert, and it has all the makings of a perfect storm where a lot of people could die if someone didn't save their necks. And that's the introduction to the story today. Please turn with me to 1 Samuel 25. I will be reading verses and commenting. Verse 1. Now Samuel died. This was the priest, Samuel, that had um, told King David that he was going to be king someday. He was the priest of Israel. And he passed away, it says. And all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him at his home in Ramah. Then David moved down into the desert of Paran. So as the camera pans across this vast, deserted, rugged wilderness, we see these rough-hewn people. They're surviving without the help of government. They're surviving without the laws even. And this camera zooms in on this handsome young warrior. And he's standing in front of several hundred battle-hardened people, soldiers he would call them. And the warrior's name is David. 
David had already received his anointing as king. David would one day take the throne, but it has not happened yet. Saul was looking for him. Saul was jealous of him. Saul was trying to uh, take his life. Saul was pursuing him out into the desert from time to time. And David had already killed Goliath, and he had fled to the wilderness to avoid that wide net of this jealous king Saul. Instead of showing David gratitude for killing Goliath and, and the Philistines that were afflicting them, Saul turned in this jealous rage. He tried to murder him. And for years, David was living in the crags of the rocks and the, and the dust of the land. And, and um, Saul and his army couldn't take that. They would pursue him for a little period of time, and they couldn't live very long like that. So they would withdraw, and David would then be safe again, just long enough to give uh, Saul enough strength again to pursue him back into the desert. That was David's life. But he had gathered a bunch of misfits. He had gathered a bunch of men who he had trained to be fighting men. There were 600 of them, David had, that he trained to be real fighters. They were sharp. They were seasoned warriors. They were living on the edge of trouble. They were ones who could fight for David and, and fight for others. And David took them in and under his leadership trained them and, and loved them as his collection of malcontents. And, and they became a disciplined fighting force. That way, David had his army and they survived. And in a way they survived is they became self-appointed peacekeepers. They became the police of the desert. There would be people who would, would be shepherds and they'd be watching sheep and, 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 and David and his men would surround that so that nobody would come in and, and kill the sheep so nobody would come in and take the sheep or take anything from the shepherds. And David and his men were those peacekeepers. They were actually the lawmen of the region. And their services were needed. They were desired and they were mostly appreciated for those who needed protection and needed justice. Now the wilderness of Paran is to the very south side of Israel. It's down below the Red Sea, just above Sinai. We would call that land no man's land. You don't want to be there. I mean, it's just not much fun to live. It was far from anywhere. It was not influenced by government. That was kind of nice. Um, but anybody living there would have to fend for themselves. The flocks and the herds that grazed there were in danger all the time. And David and his troops came in. And fortunately, the businessmen who owned those flocks, who owned that land, who had those shepherds and servants, could hire David... And David would protect the frontier for them along with his 600 men. And as was the custom, David and his men would not demand payment for that. They would, uh, however, as a matter of integrity, the, the businessman would voluntarily offer compensation to them. The businessman would go to get their sheep sheared or they would go to sell their crops or whatever it was at the market. And... Um, it would be like kind of tipping a waitress is what the farmers or the businessmen would do for David and his group. They would feed them out of gratitude. They would, and to withhold payment would be like withholding a tip from the waitress, you know, but um, it was kind of the same rules. If you do a good job, you, you'll get a tip, right? It would be gratitude. And, and that's how David and his men lived. The protection that he provided was superb. He was known in the land for that. None of the flocks, none of the herds were harmed under David's leadership. So imagine the scene shifting from that rugged wilderness of Paran um, in the, to, the, to the trading center of Carmel. Now we're panning from David to another character. And there's a businessman, and he's gathering to, to buy and to trade there. Bales of wool are being lead, uh, uh, put onto these beasts of burden. There's the background of the shrewd entrepreneur. He's wearing the finest clothes with a satisfied smile, fondling a silver coin, one of the many that he has made that day. And he's savvy. He's a savvy businessman. But in his world, money talked. 
And despite his condescending t- behavior, he's really popular, and the only reason is because he's rich. Verse 2 and 3. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep. Very wealthy. And those were being sheared in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. Then it says he was a Calebite. Now, a Calebite would be someone from the descendant of Caleb, right? Caleb. So, uh, Caleb and Joshua were the only two that were allowed into the promised land from the originals that came out of Egypt. They were faithful, and they were allowed to do that. And anyone from the descendants of Caleb were like, uh, it'd be like the descendants of George Washington, right? I mean, these were the people that were looked up to. They would be almost kind of protected But this man, Nabal, you know what the Hebrew word for Nabal means? Fool. Now, I don't know if his mom named him that. I doubt it, but he somehow got that name, right? And uh, they call him in Scripture fool. It's the same word used through the Old Testament, mostly in wisdom literature, to refer to rude people, to, to ignorant people, to dishonest and belligerent and obstinate and stupid people. This word, Nabal. The Bible writer may have nicknamed him that, but most likely some people may have ta- called him that behind his back as well. And uh, there he was. In the original, his name is in parentheses would be like, oh, by the way, this man's name is Fool. And regardless of how he came by his name, he lived up to it. He was bigoted, he was stubborn, he was rigid, he was prejudiced, he was underhanded in his business, and and on top of that, he's a tightwad. Then the camera pans to a third character. The scene settles on this heroine. The camera pans out of that bustling trade center of Carmel and right onto this mother and this wife. She's a stunning, beautifully beautiful woman, it says, and she steps into the picture. And besides for her outward appearance, her inward beauty is going to shine. It's going to show that she's beautiful on the outside and she's beautiful on the inside, and she's strong. She has stability for Nabal and his family. He was the foundation of this foolish businessman. If any businessman says that uh, they have the best asset in the world, it had better be his wife. And she was. She was industrious, ingenious. She was a a genius. Her name was Abigail. And you know what that means? It means my father's joy. My father's joy. And this guy whose name is Fool is married to this woman whose name is my father's joy. What a gift he has. How could a woman like Abigail ended up too married to a klutz? Like this guy, right? That's how, the, the, as we tell stories in the Old Testament, as, as stories are, are, are shown us in Scripture, these questions come up, and it's really painful to see. But in those days, marriage was set up, right? A father would find a, uh, a spouse for his daughter. And fathers loved their daughters, I mean, just like they do now. I mean, they, they want the best for their daughters. They want to find somebody who's going to be stable. They want to find someone who's going to love and care for their daughter. And I'm sure that Abigail's father tried his best there. And most of the time, those marriages worked out because the father did a good job in matching, and, and they would find that they could treat each other tenderly, and, and a genuine love would grow between them because they knew they had the, the, the honor of their parents blessing them, and they would live their life. And, and even if a marriage was arranged, which may send that to us as kind of a gross thing, back then it was how it was done. And it usually, in that culture, worked out. But some people, just like today, can be fooled, can't they? Some can be fooled. Abigail's father was probably fooled. She came from a good home, but obviously didn't 
know the character flaws of Nabal and what happened with him. And maybe, maybe uh, because he was from a rich family, the, the father of Abigail thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll hook my daughter up with, with Nabal because that is a secure future in this dry land. But what we know is that this was a terrible marriage. And as a result, Abigail suffered. But she was faithful to God. She was faithful to her marriage. It was not easy for her. It is not easy for lots of us. I don't think that it's easy for any of us. I I think that um, the best we can hope for, and this is going to sound kind of fatalistic, but the best we can hope for is the marriage of two sinners, right? I mean, we know that. We're all that right? And so, but she had it really bad. She suffered. But we have to admire her. She had remarkable poise. She had keen judgment, and she saved her family. She was loyal to her family. And now here's the crisis in the story. Let's go from verses uh, 4, and we're going to go through verse, let's see, we'll read 4 through 9. While David was in the wilderness... He heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. Okay, so he's shearing sheep. He's at the marketplace. Now would be get the time that me and my men get paid, right? So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go to Nabal at Carmel to the marketplace and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you. Good health to you and to your household, and good health to all that's yours, Nabal. Now I hear that it's sheep shearing time, and when your shepherds, Nabal, were with us, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs went missing. So ask your own servants, and they will tell you this, and be favorable towards my men. Since we come at a festive time, please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for us, for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal that message in David's name. Then they waited. I think that that's pretty tactful in the way that David went around with that, doesn't it? Um, Can you imagine that... um, he sent 600 people on stallions riding up to Carmel and said, uh, you owe us now. We protected you for all those years. Now's the time. He didn't do that. He gave remarkable honor to Nabal as a businessman and as a man. And I think that's pretty cool. He recognized him as a, as a nobleman. He did it with incredible humility and And he was asking, in essence, for Nabal to give him what he thought was fair. I don't remember um, ever getting something like that from a utility company, right? Uh, Dear Mr. Spulma, peace be upon your house and, and upon your family. You've enjoyed electricity in your home for many weeks now, and since we have these expenses that we must pay, then um, don't you think you'd be able to help us with those? Please return the enclosed envelope with anything you care to send. May God bless you, you humble servants at the power company. Did you ever get one of those? Doesn't happen, does it? And I would faint if I got something like that, right? I mean, normally it basically says, pay now, put it in here, um, send it back by this date, or we're going to shut your power off. I mean, that's basically what it's going to be, right? Not with David. Gratitude for giving us the job. Shalom on your business. Now can you give us something that you would think we're worth? Nabal's response to David's men could not have been more insulting. In his response, look at the clues to show how bad this guy is. We're going to read starting at verse 10, going through 12. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days, he says. Why should I take my bread and water? 
and the meat that I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where, he says. David's men turned around and went back. When they arrived, they reported every word to David that Nabal said. And don't be fooled by Nabal's first question. Who is this David? He knew real well who David was. The statement was meant to bust David down for not having the same pedigree as those from the line of Caleb. He was a direct descendant of Caleb, and, and, and he was saying to David, Who are you? It's a calculated slap in his face is what it is. And for David's lineage. It's like saying, you're a nobody, David. You come from nothing. You don't have any power. In fact, the present king is chasing you. I'm not going to give you nothing. And then his next comment takes a direct aim at David. He's insinuating that David and his followers were no better than slaves. Nabal is saying he preferred to give the reward of labor for those who earned it. For my guys, not a bunch of desert hooligans who are trying to extort a, a living from a real production in society, like Nabal. But there wasn't any fighting. There wasn't any arguing. The men simply turned around and went and, and they had to take uh, that and they left Nabal to just do his trading like nothing ever happened. Socializing, reveling in his success. He thought everything would carry on as usual. The problem is, is that David was probably not yet 30 years old. You remember when we were not yet 30 years old? And somebody may have slighted us like this? Were we the mature people that maybe had 600 trained warriors at our stead that could have just decimated Nabal and all of his people? What would have we done when we were 30 when somebody slighted us like that? David was not yet the man of strength and integrity that God needed in the place of king, being a king. It would take a lot of years to temper him before that. We do read that it's happening, though. In the chapter before, Saul had tried to kill David, and David did not kill Saul. That was a, I will not hurt the Lord's anointed. David is, is learning. He's, he's, he's coming to this, this point of, of understanding that, you know, God is, is sovereign, and, and he could have sprang upon the life of Saul and got rid of him, but, but he's changing, but not all yet. There's this impulsive response from this fool, from this thankless Nabal. And, and now, without praying for wisdom in his choice, let's look how David responded. Verse 13, David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped on his sword as well. And about 400 men went up with David and left 200 behind with the supplies. I'm talking about a story that's building right now. David's rustling across the desert and dust is raising and they're running at full speed with all their horses and they're strapped with their swords and there's this cloud of dust and death that's riding towards Nabal and his family that day. It's not just Nabal, it's his family. His doom and his family's doom was sure. The tent of his family at the end of that day was going to be soaked with blood. And David was going to do it. I would imagine that David's men being trained for this kind of thing couldn't wait for this. This is going to be a, a bloodbath, right? But meanwhile, there's a servant that's listening to Nabal's insults, probably someone that was around Nabal all the time and was sick of this blow bag, and he knew that um, there was somebody in that family that would actually listen. Somebody in that family that actually had a soft heart for, towards information. And there's this servant, and he's listening. And he slipped out, and he talked to Abigail. He knew Abigail would listen. 
because that's what intelligent people do. Let's, um, let's look at verses 14 through 17. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, you know, David sent messengers from the wilderness to, to give our master his greetings. But Nabal hurled insults at them. Yet David's men were very good to us. They didn't mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing went missing. Like, they protected us. They did their job. Night and day, they were a wall around us as the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. So Abigail thought it over. She said, he said, Abigail, think that over and see what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. This is the servant talking to Abigail. And he said, Nabal is such a wicked man that nobody can talk to him. Y'all work for a boss like that? You know people in your life? I, I see Andrew turn around to his dad. His dad's his boss. No, he's got a good boss there, Andrew. Talking about bad bosses. Abigail heard it straight. Her entire household was in danger. Isn't it telling how casually that servant speaks about Nabal to his wife? How tragic it must be to live under the authority of somebody like that. A person who won't listen. A person who you can't even go to. Doesn't have the respect for anybody in his family or in his, in his work probably not his mother or his, his, his wife or his, the mother of his children either. And Nabal still exists. I want you to think about that. Abigail could have thought, David's on the way to finally get rid of my husband for me, right? This is a good way to do this. This is natural. The fool will be killed. We had the opportunity to get rid of Nabal finally. We'll just let things lay. The problem is, is that she knew that David and his men would not just come for Nabal. David and his men would come for her children too. This was a mother who was faithful to protect not only her husband, but also her family. Not because he deserved it. It wasn't because he was good. It's because she was good. And despite how bad of a man this guy had been, she chose to remain faithful and honorable in her role as his partner, even when he was out of earshot. Look at verse 18. Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five siyas of roasted grain, that's about 60 pounds, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs. And she loaded them on the donkeys. And she said to her servants, go ahead, I will follow you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal what she was doing. This meal was enough for an army. It was David's army and then some. She was going to go with a peace offering. She was going to go to talk to David and her men. This was an unselfish woman moving to save her husband and her children's neck because that's what a good woman does. And all the while, I got to believe she's preparing in her mind what she's going to say to these people riding across the desert with blood in their eyes. What a strong woman. Verse 20, and she came riding her donkey into the mountain ravine, and there was David and his men descending towards her, and she met them. She looked at, 
look at look at scripture here. It gives a commentary on what David had just said to his army. So just before she came, David had said something. Maybe he parked him up before that ravine and had a speech with him. And maybe this was the final journey down through that ravine. And, and he said to his men, verse 31 or 21, David just said, It's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing he had was missing and he's paid me back evil for good, he said to his men. This is a rally cry. May God deal with David be so ever severely if by morning I leave alive one male of all that belongs to Nabal. Abigail's children were at risk as well. When Abigail saw David, verse 23, she quickly got off her donkey. She bowed down before David with her face to the ground. How many of you have mothers who do incredibly great things by being a servant in your family? She bowed down before David with her face to the ground. And this is the climax of the story. Tension's been building. There's going to be a clash. David and Nabal were about as opposite as two people could be, but not right now. They're both being foolish. Both were obstinate, proud men. Each believed the other one was a fool. Each allowed anger to rule over their judgment. Each were shooting their mouth out at each other. Both were acting rashly and they were led by the sinful impulse rather than good sense. And at the climax of the story, enter Abigail. And what did she do to resolve the conflict? Her only appeal was to David. She knew speaking to Nabal would accomplish nothing. So she rides out to David. She puts her face in the dirt. And and look at the wisdom here. She's addressing two foolish guys in her life. She's in the middle here. If you ever feel like you're in the middle, between the children and the the husband, between a situation and, and your family, and here's Abigail, so strategic. It was to remind David of his identity. What a brilliant thing. What have you thought of that? Look at verses 24 through 31. She fell at David's feet and said, Pardon your servant, talking about herself, my Lord. Let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say to you. Please pay no attention to the wicked man Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool, and folly goes with him. But as for me, your servant, I did not see the the men my Lord sent. In other words, she wasn't there in Carmel when those men came to talk about maybe getting reimbursed. She wasn't there. I wasn't there, she was saying. I did not see the men my Lord sent. In other words, I know you made an appeal. I would have taken care of it if I was there. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since The Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from even avenging yourself with your own hands. May your enemies, she said, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. Let this gift which your servant has brought to you, to my Lord. Notice all the time she uses the word Lord here. It's a purpose for that. It's not the Lord. She's giving honor to David, who is to be king someday. That's what she's doing. She's addressing the future king of Israel. Yet, and he wasn't that yet. But she's doing that. And may you take this gift and be given to the men who follow you. Verse 28, please forgive your servant's presumption. The Lord, your God, will certainly make a lasting dynasty for you, my Lord, because you fight the Lord's battles, and no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live. You see what she's doing? It'd be like coming to your friend and saying, well, the Lord's watching. You got this calling. The Lord's watching. You got this calling. The Lord's watching. Verse 
She knows about Saul. She says, verse 29, even though someone's pursuing you to take your life, the life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. God is protecting you, David, for a reason. But the lies of your enemies, he will hurl away as, a, as did you see this? As from the pocket of a sling. <laughs> I love that. She had heard the stories about him killing Goliath with a sling and a rock. And she inserts that into her speech. What awesome wisdom. David knows that, yes, Samuel came out to the desert and he appointed me and anointed me as king. So one day I was going to be king and the Lord has provided for me and the Lord is protecting me and the Lord was the one who brought that battle around with that sling. And the Lord's still here for me. Verse 30, when the Lord has fulfilled for my Lord, for you, David, every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience, this is the close, the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having to have to avenge himself. But when the Lord your God has brought my Lord success, remember your servant. David, if you bring this needless avenging to, to Nabal and my family, he is the descendant of Caleb. You think that word's not going to get out? Protect your reputation here. Just turn around, David. Do what would be best for your interest, David. In effect, look ahead. You're not even 30 years old. And, and, and you, can't, you can afford to return some good for evil here. You've got a long life. So just do that. Protect your reputation. But if you kill one of descendants of Caleb, David, it's not going to be good for you. What wisdom. What incredible wisdom there. And observe David's response. Will it be like the response of Nabal? Verses 32 through 34. David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. Men, when is the last time you've said to your wife, and children, when is the last time you've said to your mother, Praise be to the Lord, for you've been sent to my life. Verse 33. May you be blessed, Abigail, for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet you, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive at daybreak. David was about to murder a man because Nabal wounded his pride. Nabal didn't pay a bill. And there's not much of a difference in the character of David before this period as of Nabal. That's what the Lord is doing in the Word today. He's showing us that there's two fools operating here. And the life of a woman came in. She was a wise woman. And she saved a lot of necks. David's future her families from death. God uses wise and godly, faithful women. Scripture calls David a man after God's own heart. This cannot mean that obviously David was a perfect man, especially when we read Scripture today again. He's impatient, he's rash, he's passionate, he's far from being perfect, he's far from being a man's own, from, from a man after God's own heart at this point, isn't he? But whatever touches the heart of God also touched the heart of David that day. Whatever moved God to act compassionately without judgment also moved David that day. And his messenger was a godly woman. Verse 35, then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, go home in peace. Shalom. And your household too. 
I have heard your words. I have granted your request. And catastrophe was averted. Nabal lived to insult again. David avoids a horrible uh, um, reputation for murdering someone from Caleb's descendancy. And that's the end, right? What's the result of us being obedient? What's the result of us being faithful? There's a little bit more here. There's a couple pages in my note sheet I want to read here for you. It's a wonderful story, but there's a little more excitement because obedience, it requires us to sacrifice something. Obedience makes us want something for God's favor, something of what God desires, and, and, and we anticipate God's favor for our obedience and when we obey, God delights to surprise us with a far greater blessing. Your children have been wandering for many years. Your children may be even away from you for one reason or another, but you remain faithful and you pray to God and you thank God for your children and you, you thank God for your household. And, and I believe that the obedience and praying will one day give you what the Lord desires for you. And you might not see it in your lifetime. But being faithful doesn't require that something we see in our lifetime is done, right? The Hebrews, Hebrews 11 is, is full of the people. It says not one of them was there to, to see what God provided. But they were faithful. Verse 36. When Abigail went to Nabal, so she goes back home, he was in the house, he was holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits, he was very drunk. And she told him nothing at all till daybreak. That makes sense, right? Wouldn't the story end up great if Abigail was to be able to go home and Nabal in thankfulness puts his arms around his wife, the 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 mother to his children, and instead she comes home to a beer party and a drunk husband again. He had no idea that he had been a dead man walking. He had no idea of the great prize he had in his wife and the mother of his children. And my heart goes out to these mismatched mates today who struggle through each week and craving the slightest attention, the slightest thankfulness, if that's where you are today, maybe you're still waiting for those kind words to come. I want to encourage you, continue to be faithful. Because those kind words will come from God. And so will your blessing. Husbands, affirm your loved ones today. Children, affirm your mothers. Don't wait. Remember that Nabal and Abigail would have died too probably as their household if it wasn't for a faithful mother. I have a pastor. I've buried people. And at the grave site, I've had people whisper in my ear. I don't know why it just took, it dawns, it dawns on me now. I don't know why it just dawns on me now all the things that she meant to me. Don't wait till they're gone. Say it now. Thank you for all you do. I don't, I don't want to think about what life would be without you. And mothers and wives do that for your husband as well. And poor Abigail, she didn't receive any of that. She probably fell into bed exhausted. She probably started crying out of thankfulness that her household was being saved and out of horror that her husband was the way he was. And then morning came, verse 37. Then in the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him. And he became like a stone. And about ten days later, the Lord, the Lord struck Nabal. And he died. And the death of any human being is not to be taken lightly. But I got to believe 
if we were talking about someone like bin Laden or Hitler or Hussein or some other well-known horrible people that we can conjure up, at this point in the story, the audience would be cheering. David left justice in the hands of God. Abigail entrusted her future into the hands of God. And both of them sacrificed a foreseeable future that looked attractive to them, yet they chose to do what was right. If you're a fan of fairy tale endings, you're going to love this one, verse 39. We're almost done. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong. He has kept Nabal's wrongdoing down in his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail asking her to become his wife. His servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to take you back to become his wife. And she bowed down with her face to the ground again, and she said, I'm your servant. I'm ready to serve you. I'm ready to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Not like, <laughs> sweet, I'm the wife of the next king, man. You know, right? No, I'm here to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Those dusty 600 people warriors, right? I'm ready to do that. And she quickly got on a donkey, verse 42, and attended by her five female servants. She went with David's messengers and became his wife. David was a real man. David was a strong person, enough to realize he was wise to take a wise rebuke from a woman of all things. to examine his choices, to show him how to trust the Lord, to show him to do what's right in God's eyes. This was an extraordinary woman. She was an extraordinary wife. She was an extraordinary or a, uh, a mother which, of which a fool would be unwise, a fool, to overlook. It was an uncommon faith. And in reward, God blessed both of them. For doing the right thing. And the application is simple. Trust God for his judgment. Let me urge you to listen to the mate or to the mother or to a woman in your life that God has given and placed into your life. Who knows, one day they may save your neck. Literally. They probably already have. Thanks be to God. Happy Mother's Day. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the women that you have put in our lives. And regardless of the circumstances, we want to thank you for bringing us right here, right now, to hear your very word of being faithful and obedient and trusting you for our future. Let us listen to what is wise. Let us put aside what is foolish. Let each and every person today that's listening enjoy the time that they are spending with their family and if those who wish they could be with family today let them have the love that you give them hold them up in the palm of your hands wrap your arms around them and show them that you lord have also been said like a hen who covers his chicks you cover and love your people so, Lord, we all fall under that, and we praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Stand with us to sing our song of response this morning, the love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell it goes beyond 
the highest star and reaches to the lowest hill. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave His Son to So I want to take a couple minutes to, well, not a couple minutes, just 30 seconds to say happy Mother's Day to my mom, too. This is uh, someone that I can't sit with on a Sunday morning. I was able to spend time with her yesterday. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. People of God, as you go today, we're going to have a special a video for those of you uh, who are mothers to watch. And um, that's going to be something that I think is going to be quite entertaining. But as you go, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. And as you go today, make sure that you uh, give to the giving box on the way out. You can click on the connect card for giving on the, on the internet as well. And um, I'm going to give a free gift for the first mother who can tell me the date of the summer picnic. Is, who was that that said? Was that Trish? Or? All right, okay. Well, the free gift is a uh, foundation gift bag, and so you're going to have to split it, Trish and Sue, but that's not fair. Sue's our administrator. She puts it in the, you know, but um, people of God, let's look at the uh, video. That, why don't you have a seat, and let's look at a video that we have playing for you. Stand with us to sing our closing song, Lay Me Down. With his heart open wide From the depths, from the heights I will bring a sacrifice 
lifted high Hear my song, hear my cry I will bring a sacrifice I will bring a sacrifice I lay me down I'm not my own I belong to you alone Lay me down Lay me down Whoa. And on my heart This much is true There's no life apart from you Lay me down Lay me down Letting go of my pride Giving up all my rights Take this life and let it shine Take this life and let it shine I lay me down, I'm not my own I belong to you alone Lay me down, lay me And remember that you're not alone in this life. God is with you. Happy Mother's Day.